You know, there's a lot of myths out there associated with the stock market, and maybe I could have called them at one time wives' tales, but I guess that's no longer politically correct. I'm going to look at some of the major ones, and it turns out about half of them are just clearly wrong. Here are the seven biggies. There's buy and hold strategy. I'm going to make an argument that's pretty good. Uh, Low-cost index funds. Boy, that one's really profound. Dollar cost averaging, on the other hand, is, well, we'll see what there's problems with that. Reinvesting dividends, there's a problem there. People say the Roth IRA tax-free is better. I'm going to say watch it on that one. Uh, selling and not buying options is actually preferred. And the earlier the better is good for both starting out as well at the end of your life. Well, the market as a whole, as well as individual securities, can go up, go sideways, go down. And we're going to argue that's going to be pretty hard to uh, pick. It's called timing. And also, picking stocks specifically is even more problematic. If you will, take a look at what's called the efficient market hypothesis, which test after test after test shows holds. Now, it turns out, if you have information, by the time you get it, it's too late. And if you get it early and act on it, it's a crime. And if you don't think they'll catch you, they will. Because remember, every one of those trade tickets has an account number, your name, and even if it's a long-lost relative in Serbia, I'm actually citing an actual case, they'll still catch you. Uh, if you don't believe me, ask Martha Stewart. Now, if you will, look at this information. Tomorrow's information is a function of tomorrow's news and you don't have it unless you're an insider, remember that's a crime. What's the average rate of return on tomorrow's information? About zero. Slightly positive for, for the purposes now. Let's call it zero. So you can't beat it. And to take this a step further, there are two types of investors, and I don't mean stocks versus bonds, although we will look at that, but the way they view the world. And we have the valuation models here for stocks and the valuation model here for bonds. And it turns out, if regardless of whether they're trading at a premium or a discount, the return you get back is not the return achieved by the firm. It's not uh, the interest rate on the bond. It turns out it's the discount rate, regardless. And it turns out, if you specifically in the case of a stock investor, solve for that return, there's two components. There's the current yield plus growth. They add together. Turns out about, oh, 40% of it's in the yield. And the two types of investors, the value investor likes to buy high yield stocks. That's when they often drop. And the momentum investor likes to buy the growth. That's often when they rise. Study after study shows they go in and out of flavor about every two, three years. And on average, they do about just as well as each other. And by the way, these two folks don't really get along. I've had discussions that almost broke out into a fist fight. One leases, one buys, one wears new clothes, the other one doesn't. Yeah. Let's look at low-cost index funds. They typically have no load charges, very low expense ratios. Now, the active manager may charge 2% a year. Oh, gee, that's not that much. Look at the graph. You wind up doubling it by saving 2% a year, say, across 40 years. We'll look at this again. Now, the active manager, there may be a couple every year that outperform, but then so do the lottery winners and those that score the progressives on the slot machines in Las Vegas. They were just merely lucky. There's an extra benefit often overlooked with an index fund, unlike, say, a managed fund in most cases, and that is they automatically include the best hard-to-pick winners in the portfolio, and that's above and beyond the traditional argument about diversification. Let's look at dollar cost averaging. Uh, the argument starts out like this. Uh, say I have a dollar share and I buy a hundred of them, a hundred bucks, 
and it goes up to a dollar ten. I could buy well ninety one point nine one shares, and if it goes down to say ninety cents, notice that's a gain or a loss of ten percent. I could buy one hundred eleven point one one shares, and I take the average of those two share amounts, I would actually have 101.01 shares. And that's a good thing to buy more when the price drops. First comment, you almost cannot help but do this anyhow because in any retirement program or income you put into the market, you'll be buying regardless. Secondly, it's just lousy math. Take a look at this. Same scenario, but now let's take it two steps. Again, the security goes up or down 10%, uh, $1.10 or say 90 cents, and maybe it goes up or down 10% again. Watch it. Well, let's see. It could go up now to $1.21, or it could go down to, I said watch it, 99 cents. Or it could have gone down to 90 cents and up 10%. Watch it again. That's now 99 cents. Or it could have gone down 90 cents and then down again another 10% to 81 cents. Well, there's two cases at 99, one at 121, one at 81. Average of those four, one buck. It all averages out. Let's look at reinvesting dividends. At one time when commissions were really high, well, there's something to be said for it. Nowadays, with almost zero commissions, let's see why that's not probably such a good idea. First of all, obvious one, it doesn't diversify. You're keeping all your eggs, not only in the same basket, but in the same eggs. Then you have oddball amounts. You started off with, say, 200 shares. Now you've got 217.3 shares. You, you know why that's a problem? As we will see later, it's probably a good idea to be able to sell, not buy, covered call options. And those are in units of 100. So if you have an oddball unit, you're out of the game. It also complicates taxes, albeit it's a little bit easier now with all this automatic computer filing. But now you've got income categories that you have to tease out, and it just complicates things. Here's another biggie. You don't get income. You either need income to pay off your margin, to live on, and, well, you've reinvested it. You don't have the income. I'm not fond of reinvesting dividends. Now the next one is my bugaboo. A lot of gurus say go for the Roth tax-free IRA account. By the way, that's not redundant. The A here stands for arrangement. And it turns out it depends. If you look at the ratio of the monies you get out, it's the top line of these two divisors down here, and it's after tax in the case of a traditional IRA, no tax in the case of a Roth tax free, and you divide it by the amount you put in, you get the deduction going in in the case of the traditional. Well, look what? The ratios are the same if the tax bracket or the income tax state is the same. What if they're not? What if you retire in a higher state of income or in a state that charges a higher income tax? you would be better off with a Roth. On the other hand, if you're in a lower income state or a lower state of having income, you'd actually get a better return with a traditional. Now that's something to think about. Now, to be fair, if you're in a high income tax state, such as, say, one-third bracket, you will put away about almost one-half more if you do use a Roth. Let's look at those states that charge high and low income taxes. Here are the states that charge the highest state income tax. Remember, it's federally taxed regardless in the case of the traditional IRA. And here are the states that have no income tax. These would be preferable in the case for holding the traditional IRA account if you wind up living there. Here's a graphic all about options, and you can skip this if you like. But on the other hand, remember it's the rich that can afford to pay attention. I've color-coded everything here. Red are losses, greens are gains, and on the left are calls, on the middle are puts, and you have your long and short positions. A call, you give up it, the security. If you sell it, you buy it if you bought it. On the other hand, a put, if you bought it, it goes up if the stock goes down, and you're ready to give up the security. 
In the case of selling a put, you're ready to receive the security. Now, generally speaking, about oh, 9 out of 10 options were expire worthless. And so when you get that unsolicited phone call from the broker trying to make you broker, they generally want to do that to you. I suggest, on the other hand, don't buy these to speculate. Don't even buy these as insurance. They're very expensive. But instead, act as the insured selling them. Now, not to sell them, but in lieu of limit orders. In the case of selling a call, you can even do these in covered positions, even in an IRA account. All you're going to do is sell the security if it goes up. What's a good thing about that? You receive the income regardless of whether it happens. Secondly, it forces you to do the right thing. Sell it when it rises. If you sell a put, that's only in advanced accounts. Can't do that normally in an IRA account. And you sell a put, you're ready to buy the security, which you would have done had you used a limit order. Uh, something to think about. And we come to the end, or maybe the beginning, depending on your perspective, and that is rule of thumb, start early. We've seen this graph before, but let's look at it again. If you start 10 years earlier across a 40-year path toward investing, turns out that extra 10 years, only a quarter of the time, will double the amount you have at the end. And as we noted before, if you can save 2% a year, it doubles it again. But at the end of your life, starting early is yet another good idea when it comes to Social Security. A lot of wags out there, and boy, do they wag their tongues. They think, well, gee, you know, if I delay Social Security from 66 to 72, that's for those in the relevant uh, age bracket right now, uh, I'll get more money. Nominally true, but if you discount it at 5% or higher, there is no scenario in which you're ever better off taking it later. Meaning, whether it's investing in the market, your ability to enjoy it, whether you're doubtful you'll ever get the funds, if you just use a 5% discount rate or higher, it's better to take it at 66 than later. Something to think about with Dr. C Invests.